Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you again tonight. We just thank you for this time to be here to just study your word, to spend time to worship you. Father, we want to thank each and every one that's here tonight. We want to continue to pray for Ruth. Just be with her. Just uh, put your healing touch on her. Just, Father, just bless this church. Just pray that you be with your servant tonight as I preach your word. Father, we just pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, that they'll just turn to you, Lord. Just realize that salvation is only through you. Father, we just pray for all those godly preachers and missionaries that are out there trying to preach your word. And pray, Lord, they might be able to win many souls for you. Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, continuing with our Genesis chapters 1 through 11 series, this will be part 17. And we're going to start off on Genesis chapter 6, verse 16. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 16. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, verse 16. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Now God told Noah to build a window one cubit tall. Remember I told you that's about 20.6 inches tall. Uh, you know, I believe that's the proper dimension rather than the 18 that everybody... Because I believe that 18 inches came around later on. Now God only gives a height and not a length. Now there's one theologian said that this window went around the entire ark to provide some small amount of light in the ark. Not much natural light with continuous rain and violent weather though. But most likely provide ventilation of air for everyone inside. Now I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I scripture doesn't say so it's it's theoretically possible, I suppose. But, you know, usually you always see like this little window with a door, because it says, you know, it's got like a door on the window. My Bible's got here, it says 1.5 feet. And I've got... Oh, for the, the height, you mean? The cubit. Mine okay. says 20 Well, inches. Well, cubit, that'd be, yeah, 1.5, 1, 1. that would be uh, 18 inches, but that's what I'm saying, that's... I don't agree with that. That you know that that's what everybody always says is eight to eighteen inches. But as I tried to explain last week, I think it was that the, the cubit was actually changed. That this was what was known as a royal cubit or an Egyptian cubit, and I believe that was the standard cubit up until the time of Solomon, King Solomon of Israel. He then changed it to eighteen inches. So then that became the standard for like rest of scripture. But you know, in my opinion, I, I don't. I think before that they were always using the bigger cubit. So I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, I'm not, but I mean, also like remember I told you that that this Ron White when he found Noah's Ark, then which I believe he really did. If it truly was that, which I don't know what else it would have been, he found, but it actually measured up. Then the cubit did match this twenty point six rather than the eighteen inches. So if it really was the Ark, which I believe it was then it would also back up to 20.6 versus the 18 as well. But, like I said, I'm not going to get in a big argument if somebody wants to say 18, but, so, you know, I just I just don't agree with it, but yeah. Right. Well, like I said, most theologians, they'll tell you the 18 inches. You know, I'm, I'm in the minority for sure, but I, by my reasons, what I've already explained, I believe that that's why it's the 20.6. But, like I said, as far as this window... You know, scripture doesn't say, this is one theologian, like I said, he believes it might possibly go around the whole ark. And that's possible, but I, um, you know, the, the, you know, he was said the overhang on the roof would have helped keep the rain out of the ark. But there's other parts of scripture where it kind of talks about, you know, there was like a little door on, on, the, on the window, you know, to like keep it shut. So I wouldn't think it would cover the whole thing or, you know, I don't know how you'd yeah. open up a giant door the whole length, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's more like you see in the pictures of just like a small window. Uh -huh. 
And, you know, that's when you see the bird goes out or whatever. You know, because the thing is, he, he wouldn't need the light. God's in there with him anyway. So, you know, Jesus is already inside. So he's in the natural light there. And as far as ventilation, again, I'm sure they probably still had some way to get ventilation. If not, you know, God was going to provide for them just like the animals. I mean, I don't worry about the little things like that. God finds a way to provide for them. He says, I want you in there. It's going to find ventilation for them. So... Uh, I don't think it's necessary you have to have it the whole length just for ventilation. But again, I'm not going to, that's what somebody believes. That's, you know, scripture doesn't directly 100% say. But our studies have shown that you would, as I said, not need this opening around the whole ark as the movement of the animals keeps the air moving. So, you know, again, right there is one of the possibilities of why, you know, the air would still, you'd have this air moving. You know, it's kind of like, running water, you know, it keeps it circulating, you know, versus, that's why yeah, animals don't die in running water. I wonder how they cleaned up after them. Oh, there's different opinions on that. They, some think they had a little chute they designed to uh, let the animal waste go down, and there's there's all kinds of theories. I mean, no, we don't get We don't really know. But, again, it's also one of those things that, you know, God might have had some of these animals in, like, a temporary... Um, you know, I'm going to get into that here in a little bit, but uh, a temporary, like a hibernation type thing. So, you know, they wouldn't have been as much waste as you normally would. You wouldn't also need as much food as you normally would. And, That's you know, I mean, again, you know, scripture doesn't say, but I'm sure they had some elaborate way to get rid of the waste. I mean, they probably had some way to almost reprocess it, you know, or something. Because remember, everybody had been vegetarians at this time, including the animals and the people. So maybe there's some way you could almost. You know, remake it into, you know, kind of like the modern, your modern uh, wastewater plant, treatment plants, that's what they do now. They take all your waste and... Well, that mushrooms down, you know, where they fell down, they have mushrooms thrown in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> but, I mean, but the thing is, like I said, you know, like our modern wastewater treatment plants, They'll sit there and they'll take all the you know the waste and they, the time they get done processing it, you could drink the water. So I'm not saying obviously they didn't have, but they might have had some kind of uh, filtration. filtration type thing or something. You know, so who, who knows? I mean, God somehow provided for that. You know, I mean, it would be interesting to see how that was done though. But but anyway, then according to studies, by the movement of animals, you know, that would keep the air moving, and then that makes sense. I mean, it's just like anything you know you get people in here or something you know it's not gonna get stale just like you know people moving around but most likely this is not what god is referring to but rather as i mentioned i believe that it was the small window with a door to shut to keep water out as many artists portray you know more like i as i said i believe it's more like what you see in the artist you know a smaller window rather than you know going around the whole art and Genesis chapter 8 verse 6 seems to imply this. Turn, turn ahead a couple chapters. I just want to read this first. We'll get into it more when we... Genesis chapter 8 verse 6. I want to turn there because, uh, like I said, we'll get into more detail when we get in that chapter. But Genesis chapter 8 verse 6. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. So in other words, if you're opening the window, you know, it had to have... You know, obviously it wasn't a glass window like we have now, so, you know, it probably had some kind of like a little wooden door that was just covering this opening. Mm -hmm. it just opened it. Right, it's just a little opening and then probably, and then they had a little door that latched in the inside or something, and then they could open it up, you know, that's how the bird got out or if they wanted to look out or something, but, um, you know, again, like I said, during all the storm, you're not going to have a lot of light, so, you know, for, for them saying, well, it would be used for a little bit of light, and, you know, plus, like I said, Jesus is in there. You know, he's the natural light, you know, and if nothing else, who doesn't know what kind of technology they didn't have? I mean, everybody, again, thinks that they were, they were so Stone Age type thing, you know, which, you know, again, Stone Age is not even, that's an evolutionary thing, you know, that's not true. There never was no Stone Age people or, you know, all that type of stuff. And, you know, there was a lot of technology they had that was better than what we have now. I mean, like I said, look at the pyramids. I mean, we our modern helicopters and everything else, cranes can't even pick up these stones, so how did they do it, you know? So, you know, who's to say they didn't have some kind of um, 
technology. I mean, even the Israelites years later, they had elaborate water systems in order to get water into Jerusalem. You know, some of that evidence is still around today. So, you know, we don't really know exactly, but I mean, I, I think, like I said, as far as the window, I believe it was this, you know, just a small window with a little door on it or whatever, but I keep it closed. You know, and at the very least, this window, as I said, could be closed and did not stay open during the flood for ventilation. You know, that's what first we just read here, chapter 8, verse 6, seems to be implying. It wasn't something that was kept open. I mean, you know, you got to understand, this is a, the flood was a violent time. I mean, that, that there was all kinds of water shooting up, rain coming down. I mean, it was probably, you know, not like, you know, they talk about this, this uh, weather bomb or what they call that the other day, cyclone, whatever that weather thing they called it. That, you know, they're getting like five or six inches of rain. You know, they're probably getting five or six inches of rain every hour or more. You know, I mean, about like five or six inches in 24 hours. I mean, we're talking heavy rain, water shooting up, probably big waves and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, volcanoes erupting, all that kind of stuff. So, but <clears throat> most likely this was an opening in the ark with the small doors, I said, as seen in pictures. But it is possible that the window was an actual glass or plastic type material that could be seen through to allow a little light in and they could see out. Now again, we don't know what technology they had, so it's possible they had some kind of like a plastic type stuff or whatever. You know, glass is just made out of sand. So, you know, who knows? They might have had glass and then people forgot about it because, you know, people get dumb and then they lose it and then the technology, we, we just rediscovered it, so to speak. So, but most likely it was probably, you know, like a wooden door or something on it, you know, but I'm just throwing out some things that people mention and, you know, but like to, I would guess it's probably like a small wooden door on there with a little latch. Now, John Wood Morapi wrote a book called Noah's Ark, a feasibility study that explains much of this stuff. You know, and he talks about what you just asked about, how to get rid of animal waste and all this stuff. And he's got all these explanations and, you know, uh, theoretically what kind of stuff could have been done. And, you know, they talk about it at the Ark Encounter. They have a little of their own explanation there. If you go there to Kentucky, uh, you know, like I said, we're not going to get into all that kind of stuff. But, but also, you know, according to him and, and different things, you know, they most likely had some kind of lamps for lighting inside the Ark. Though, as I said, God was inside with them, so he may have provided some light just as he did with the Israelites with the fire by night. You know, I mean, at the very least, you know, just like the Israelites had the candles, you know, they could light and so forth. I mean, I'm sure they had at least some type of uh, artificial light in there besides Jesus as well, you know, if they needed it, you know. You know like I said, Jesus may have provided a little type of fire or something in there, you know, we don't really know. Scripture doesn't say, but... The door was most likely a ramp that was the height of the ark and was used to allow the animals to enter the ark. Now the ark was made up of three stories. Again, we always see that number three appearing that you know it's very significant, you know, with God. You know, so it's 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 not a coincidence that three stories instead of four stories or five stories or whatever. But the laminated wood or the gopher wood that I mentioned last week, that the ark was made up of was also in three layers with, again, the number three representing the Godhead. But, you know, more than likely, that ramp, you know, could cover all three of them, so it's possible that they could move it somehow to, so that the animals could enter each layer, you know, each uh, level, rather than having to go in the ark on the bottom and then have to go up a, a ramp on the inside of each level. I mean, which, you know, could be either where they, you know, might have going up that ramp on the inside, kind of like they have at the, the Ark at the Ark Encounter, you know, it might be something similar to that. You know, we don't really know for sure, but as far as that other one, I'm sure that door covered the whole height of the Ark, but it it's possible it didn't. But now notice that there is only one door into the Ark. Now I mentioned how the Ark was a type of Jesus and was the Ark of Salvation for Noah and his family. Now, I mentioned a little bit of that in one of my sermons. Now, just as Noah and his family could only be saved if they entered the ark by this one door, people can only be saved by entering the door of Jesus Christ. Now, the way of salvation is narrow, 
And Jesus is the only way of salvation. Not Muhammad, Buddha, the Pope, Mary, the church, religion, works, any false gods or any other way that you can come up with. Let's take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You know, if you read on, you know, it talks about, you know, broad is the way to destruction and so forth. You know, that's the whole thing. There's, there's one narrow way. You know, that word straight there, where it says, because straight is the gate, that word straight means narrow. You know, remember, again, the King James Bible has a built-in dictionary, so it tells you the word straight means narrow in the next next section of it. But there's also, if you don't believe me, they have what they call the, the straight of Gibraltar and some of those. And like I said, that word means narrow. It's just a narrow entrance. But, you know, the way is narrow, but it's not hard or difficult like a lot of the new Bibles try to say. They try to say that, that salvation is difficult. It's not difficult. It's just... There's only one way to get there. The only way is through Jesus, not all these other ways that man tries to come up with. But those in Noah's day could only be saved from the coming flood by entering the ark through this single door, just as people today can only be saved by the single door of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus provided mercy to Noah and his family, even in his time of judgment on the earth, and he will provide mercy today. To all those who call upon Jesus to save him. Now those outside the ark perished and only those inside were saved. Now the same can be seen in the fact that those outside the door of Jesus will perish in their sins and spend eternity in the lake of fire. Whereas only those who have entered the door of Jesus will be saved and have everlasting life. Now Noah obeyed God and saved his house, and due to his obedience and righteousness, God placed him in the Faith Hall of Fame. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. We'll see that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Again, this whole chapter is all about the, what I call the Faith Hall of Fame. Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You know, and I want to make one comment here too that this verse seems to also imply that it says, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. That things not seen as yet. Now, obviously, there wasn't, had never been a global flood before that time, and obviously, there's never been one since, and there never will be. But I also believe that refers to the fact that it had never rained on the earth prior to the flood. You know, there's people that will argue with me and say, well, the scripture doesn't say that. Well, it talks about a mist came up from the ground and so forth. And, you know, scripture doesn't say, you know, directly that there wasn't, but why would you need the mist if you had a rain? And, I think that was the big deal. So people were mocking them that, well, it was not, you know, you say it's going to rain, what's well, rain, and it's never rained before. Well, I think this kind of backs it up that, you know, it's showing that of things that had not been seen before because it had never happened. You know, so I think it was more than just the global flood. I think it's referring to the fact that it had never rained. I think that verse kind of backs it up as well. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, and let's take a look at uh, verse 17. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. 
Now, God tells Noah that he is going to destroy all flesh on the earth with a flood, both man and animal that breathe. Now, that, that's significant there that says that breathe. You know, that we'll get into that. But God said everything would die. Now, many of the animals in the water would survive as they do not breathe air, but even many of them would die from the water bursting from the seafloor and other violent weather, as well as such like volcanoes erupting in the sea and warming the water. But those animals did not have to come on the ark because they were not air-breathing animals. And there's other little insects also that are not uh, air-breathing animals. So again, you don't have to bring them on the ark either. We'll get into that later on. But, but God clearly said in verse 7 that he was going to destroy man along with the beast, creeping things and follow the air. Now the purpose of the flood was to destroy air-breathing animals along with man and cleanse the earth of the pollution and corruption caused by the evil angels that we saw in, in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2. Now the animals mentioned here match the description of land animals in chapter 1 that God created on day 6. If you want to turn back to chapter 1 for just a brief moment, turn to Genesis chapter 1 verse 24. Hang on, I'm writing down a note here. Okay. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So, you know, we saw that earlier in, in this chapter about how, you know, so it, it kind of relates to the same thing about in this verse here about the, the cattle, the creeping thing, the beasts of the earth, and so forth that, that um, we see in some of those other verses that we had read about the animals that are going to be on them. But let's go to uh, Gen back to Genesis chapter 6. And let's go to verse 18. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy son's wife, wives with thee. Now God promised to save Noah and his wife, and Noah's three sons and their wives. Now only these eight people were left whose DNA had not been corrupted by the angel DNA. Now Noah was also a righteous man who loved God. God therefore promised to establish his covenant with Noah. Now, this is the first time in Scripture that God makes a covenant with a person. This covenant was the promise to Noah that from his descendants would come the seed of the woman, the promised Messiah of mankind, to bring salvation to all people, and this seed would be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Noah and his family were saved because Noah had faith in God and trusted God. They had avoided the corruption of the rest of the world. You know, even like with building the ark, you know, God told him to build the ark. He, by faith, built this ark. You know, he did everything that God told him, you know, about the animals, get the food for them, and so forth. You know, he, he had never seen rain or anything either, and, you know, but he, by faith, believed all this stuff that, you know, he, he, he could see the wickedness around him, and he trusted God. Well, let's turn to uh, verse 19 now, Genesis chapter 6, verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Now God commands Noah to bring two of every sort or kind of animal into the ark with him. Now Noah was to take one male and one female so they could reproduce after the flood. God is here again showing that homosexuality is wrong as two males or two females cannot mate and reproduce. The animal would die off and the kind would become extinct. Now remember, I mentioned before, you know, it says in here, uh, two of every sort shalt thou bring, and we'll see in this next verse about the kind, that, well, we'll just go ahead and go to this next verse, and then I'll make the comment. So go to go to verse twenty now. 
chapter 6. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Now again, that, notice the first is similar to the one we just read from Genesis 1, 24. Again, it mentions the same thing. The, the cattle, the creeping thing, the beast of the earth, you know, that type of thing. That, uh, you know, so it's showing the similarities here. But Noah was to bring two of every kind of fowl, cattle, and creeping thing on board the ark. Now, what I started to say before was, I mentioned it before, but remember, a kind is what would we kind of call something similar to a family in our classifications today. It's not a species. People are like, well, how could you get all these animals on there? And they talk about, you know, again, you know, and I, and I use the example. There's the cat kind or the dog kind or so forth, the horse kind. You know, a horse kind would be there was one horse. Now that horse, that's where you got your zebras, your, reg your regular domesticated horses, your... Uh, like uh, donkeys, you know, the asses, and, you know, that type of stuff. Same thing with the cat kind, that's where you got your lions, tigers, you know, your cheetahs, the pumas, your regular domesticated cat, you know, so forth. Same thing with the dog kind, you got your wolves, foxes, you know, the, the coyotes, and the regular domesticated dogs. You know, all of those came from one dog kind. So it wasn't like you had to have, you know, all these, you know, the poodles and the German shepherds and all these different types of dogs and all the different type of cats. No, you had one cat kind, one dog kind, one horse kind, and then they all eventually produce these other animals. So, you, you know, if you, if you start looking at it, you don't have to have, you know, all the, you know, same thing with the elephant kind. You'd have one that produced the mammoths, the mastodons, and the elephants we have living today. You know, you didn't have to have an African elephant, an Asian elephant, and, you know, the Indian elephant, whatever, all these different ones. You know, you just had the one kind. And that's why people, they, you know, they, they try to question things because they don't understand the, the meaning of kind. Now, <clears throat> pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, would be included with the fowl along with bats and birds. Remember, I explained that too, that in, in scripture, when they talk about fowls, again, you know, we, it, people think of fowls as just birds. But they're misinterpreting scripture. You know, God refers to when he's saying follows, he also includes other flying animals such as bats, which now we call them mammals, or what would been then like the flying reptiles such as pterosaurs that, you know, again, we classify them as reptiles. But, you know, God never classified animals as mammals, reptiles, fish, or whatever. That, you know, that's why they would say whales, they call whales fish. You know, we call them mammals. God, doesn't, God calls them fish. You know, we made, that's a man-made thing when we start classifying them as Mammals, reptiles, fish, amphibians, or whatever. So to say that, well, that's not what it's referring to. It's only referring to birds. That's man's classification, not God's classification. And there's there's scripture to back it up. I should have pulled one up, but um, you know when, when he starts talking about with the, Levit uh, the Levites and the, all the cleaning animals and the unclean animals and all that kind of stuff. Then it, there's even verses in there that'll talk about the fowl, and it'll it'll say right even in that verse, birds and bats. It'll have them together with the fowl. Like I said, if I think about it, I'll try to uh, get one for next week. And uh, let me I'll mark that down. So you know, God is clearly showing that in His eyes, they're one and the same. So, like I said, the fowl would include all these different, you know, other things as well, besides just birds. Now, many people, as I said, say, how did Noah find all the animals and then get them to the ark? Noah did not have to. It tells you right in this, this verse right here. If you read the, the phrase says, shall come unto thee. Look up here in this verse. It says, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. That come unto thee shows God brought all the animals that he wanted on the ark to Noah. Noah didn't have to go out and find all these animals. God brought these animals to him. God knew which animals' DNA had not been corrupted. And he also knew 
which ones would be best for survival and reproducing after the flood. You know, again, you know, you could go and look at him. If Noah had to pick him, he'd say, well, that looks like a good deer. Well, but, you know, he might know that it's got disease and so, or, you know, whatever, something that, you know, God knows which was the proper animals that were needed. And God himself brought the animals. You know, Noah was busy enough building the ark. He didn't have time to round up the animals. So, you know, God brought the animals to him. You know, as I said, God would bring the animal of the right size and age to Noah. You know, most likely the animals would not be fully grown, though they'd be able to reproduce. You know, they'd be at that age where they could reproduce. You know, a lot of animals, you know, they could reach sexual maturity, but they're not necessarily fully grown. You know, e even in people, you know, you, teenagers, you know, a girl can get pregnant at 13 years old, but she's not fully grown. So, you know, God wouldn't have to necessarily have a full-grown adult animal. You know, so again, they could have smaller animals, but yet could reproduce, but they could be smaller animals, you know, and have more room on the ark. So, as I said, by using smaller animals, this would allow for more animals on the ark without taking up so much room, and it'd be easier for Noah and his family to handle. So... You know, you, whatever animal it was, you could have a smaller, you know, let's say the elephants or the dinosaurs or whatever. You know, you wouldn't necessarily have to have a hundred foot long seropod. It might be, you know, who knows, maybe they reach such maturity at 40 feet long or something, you know. So, you know, they wouldn't have to have a full grown animal necessarily. Now, people say, how can Noah get all the millions of animal species on board the ark as there would not be enough room. Now I've already kind of, basically I guess I already kind of talked on this, I jumped ahead, but uh, the first thing is there were not millions of animals on the ark. As I said, God said to take two of each kind, not species on board the ark. And I already mentioned how the kind is similar to our classification of a, what we would call family today. And I said how, you know, he would only need, a, you know, one of the dog kind, cat kind, elephant kind, etc., horse kind, you know, so you wouldn't need every type of, of dog or cat that we breed today. Number one, even a lot of those breeds that we have now only came about, you know, some within the last 100 or 200 years. So, you know, even in 300 years ago, they didn't have some of the dog breed or cat breeds that we have today. So most of these breeds, have, as I said, have only been around for the last 100 or 200 years. The domesticated dog is from the wolf. You know, we, we know that. So a dog kind would have given us all the species we have today, and the same applies to the cat, elephant, and all of the other animals. Now, all dogs, such as domesticated, uh, uh, domestic and wolves and coyotes and foxes, can interbreed, showing they're all one kind. You know, the same applies to the cats, as, such as a tiger and a lion can mate, or horses with a zebra, or a horse and an ass where the donkey can mate. You know, so again, these show they're all one kind. And that's that's the one that's what makes the difference is that that uh, you know you can have a horse and a zebra, or like a zebra and a, and a, and a donkey, and you got a z donk. You know, or you have a lion and tiger, and they call it a liger. You know, they mix because they're not different animals. You know, if they were diff different animals, you know, then they would not be able to interbreed. So it just shows, you know, that they're all the same kind. But yet that same lion or tiger can't mate with, like, say, a, a wolf, you know, like the dog kind. Because every kind stays within itself. Bayon, you know, they all... Bayon. What? Bayon, okay. Right. That, that, you know, that God mentions earlier in the, in the first chapter how everything reproduces after its own kind. That's why... You know, you have adaptations, which is not evolution like they try to say, but you have adaptations where, like I said, we can produce different dog or cat breeds, you know, to be a little, you know, a long dog or a short dog or, you know, tall dog or whatever, you know. But they're all still a dog kind. You know, they're not, you know, Chihuahua is not any different than a Great Dane. They're still of the dog kind. You know, they might be different sizes, but so... You know, there, there's the big difference there. You know, so again, you know, studies have shown there would have been only about 1,500 kinds of animals on the ark, with estimates of between 7,000 to 16,000 animals on the ark. So much fewer animals would be needed. So again, you know, we would have had these millions of animals. That, you know, I mean, plus they get ridiculous. Like, 
Well, we gotta have all these different types of insects and this and that. Well, number one, that kind of stuff doesn't take up much room in the first place. Number two, a lot of the insects would not even been on the ark because it says you had air breathing animals on the ark. Insects breathe through their skin. They don't breathe air the way we do. They breathe their skin. So they could be outside and still been floating around on a leaf or something or whatever and breathe. You know, I mean, whether they were on the ark or not, you know, if possible, but I don't believe so because, again, that's not what scripture says. But he. Well, exactly, whatever. But I mean, even if they were, they're so small. I mean, you could take a whole bunch of small ants and, you know, how much room they have to take up. So, you know, some of this stuff, they just, people, they're just trying to find any way to discredit Scripture because no matter what you show them, they're just never going to believe it. They're just, they're ignorant fools, it's just like the Bible says. You know, they're willingly ignorant. Now, most, as I said, most likely less than 16,000 animals were on board the ark. Now, many extinct animal fossils have been found to often be of the same animal, and they were not real, if really as many dinosaurs as people think, or other types of extinct animals. You know, a lot of times they'll find a dinosaur bone, and they're like, oh, this is some new species we found, and it's, they give us some name. And then, later on, they'll find another one, and then, oh, another new species. Well, then they find out later on that all these, they have five different species that they're really all the same dinosaur. They, you know, they find out, they just rush the gun because they name a species because they found, you know, a, a part of it, a leg bone. They only have the whole leg. They only have, like, you know, the bottom section or something, and uh, it's some new species. Well, no, it's just like in, even in adults or a lot of animals. A lot of times, the young animals look completely different than an adult animal. So, you know, you know, they might it's, one might have just been like a young version, one might have been an older, you know, or more mature version or whatever. So, but you know, they found you know that, that they're really not as many dinosaurs as everybody thinks. That you know, they're really a lot of them were mistaken, and they were people naming you know a whole bunch of different dinosaurs, but they're really all the same dinosaur. So, you know, and that's the same thing with other extinct animals that. Uh, you know, for example, again, the elephant types, as I mentioned, like your mammoths, mastodons, shovel tuskers, and other types are all of the elephant kind, just like the modern elephants. So, you know, I, I want people to understand that, you know, that, that it's, it's, we're talking kinds here, which is a big different from species. So, you know, you could very easily get all these animals on the ark. And again, God would not tell Noah to do something that was not possible to be done. So whatever the reason is or whatever, you know, we could be off, I don't care, we could make up any number, God still would have a way to have those animals on the ark, or he would have said we need a bigger ark, or he would have had to bring all the animals. So, you know, I don't worry about the little things like that. put some kind of spell on them so they didn't fight and stuff. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, yeah, but the thing is, a lot of that fear didn't come until later on. You know, the fear of man of the animals came after the flood, but... You know, yeah, it's possible that he, uh, you know, like I said, kind of had some kind of like a semi-hibernation thing on or something, or just, you know, basically told him, like, you don't mess with that animal, you know, you little tiger, don't kill that mouse or whatever, you know, or something. Like that. But, <clears throat> you know, again, Scripture doesn't really say. But now, I've already mentioned how smaller animals, rather than full-grown adults, were most likely used. You know, and I just explained some of that. Now this would be especially important when bringing the large seropod dinosaurs on board, the elephants, giraffes, rhinoceroses, bears, and other large animals, you know, the hippopotamuses and so forth. You know, but you know, the reality is though, also too, there's a lot of animals, everybody thinks that you know, all these animals are so big. Most animals are not that big, you know, even like, like sharks, I like sharks too, and, and elephants and all these animals. Then everybody thinks, you know, most sharks are all these big, big, big animals. Very few of them are very big. You know, most of them are very small animals. You know, and again, now sharks aren't on the ark, so it's not really a good example. But I'm just trying to point out that, you know, we always think of all these animals as always being big. And most animals are not that big. You know, most animals, they've already shown that, um, you know, uh, let's see if I got it on here. But, uh, well, I'll get to it. I'll, Get to it in a second, but you know, most animals are no bigger than, like, say, a sheep or you know, even smaller. You know, they're not, you know, there's very few animals that are big, like, say, like I mentioned, like the elephant and the, the bears and the rhinoceroses and so forth. 
So, you know, yes, dinosaurs were on the ark with Noah. Despite what you know, evolutionists try to say, dinosaurs were made on day six, just like man, and they were on the ark along with man. Now, another factor is that most animals, as I said, were actually quite small, with only a small number being the size of a sheep. Now, the ark at the smaller dimensions had a volume, you know, this is used in the smaller cubit that we're talking here. If you're going with the 18-inch cubit, this study was done with the 18-inch cubit rather than the 20.6, which I believe it was. But even with the smaller cubit, it had a volume of 522 railroad livestock cars and would be even more than that since, as I said, I believe the ark was actually bigger. But now, each of those railroad cars can hold 240 sheep-sized animals. So, you have 522 railroad cars that could cover, and each one could hold 240 animals the size of a sheep. So you figure that out, I didn't figure it out, but 240 times 522, you know, that's a lot. And as I said, most animals are not even as big as a sheep. I mean, people, if you start thinking about it, most animals are not that big. And then if, on top of it, if you took the younger of them instead of the full-grown adults, they're not even going to be as big as that. So, you know, it's, it, there's plenty of room on that ark for those animals. Now, most of the animals... As I said, are much smaller, such as all the creeping animals. Remember, it mentions the creeping animals. Well, that'd be like, you know, your turtles, your tortoises, whatever. You know, the, the um, you know, all the little snails or whatever, and all the little creeping things, the snakes, so forth. You know, but even a snake, you know, some of your snakes, they can grow to be uh, 30 plus feet long, some of the pythons and, you know, anacondas and stuff like that. But, I mean, even then, they can curl up, you know, real small and stuff, you know. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, they're stretched out. You have to have something where they can stretch out 30 feet. They don't, you know, they wouldn't be necessary. And again, you wouldn't be taking the adults. And I already mentioned this, but as I said, many insects are not actually air breathers, so they would not have been on the ark. They breathe through their skin. But even if they were, as I said, they do not take up much room. Again, also, most birds are all of a small size as well as most other animals, and with the larger animals not being fully grown, there was ample room on the ark for the animals, food, and Noah and his family. Now, the flying animals could have had perches from the ceilings or even in a cage with a small creeping animal if you needed to save space. Now, I mean, I'm just trying to be ridiculous that, you know, people want to say there's no room. Well, then you can make room by having stuff hang from the ceilings or do whatever, you know, I mean, there's, there's possibilities, you know, even with inside a cage, you know, you could have an elephant here, but then above the elephant, have a little bird cage or something or whatever, you know, if you really wanted to. I mean, I'm just saying that people try to say there's no room, there's there's possibility. When we sing uh, Noah's Ark, the play in Branson, it was stories. Three right, the ark was has three stories, and, and there's, I mean, that, that I read that scripture. That's what it says. You know, the ark is made of three stories. So, you know, that is scriptural. And like I said, you'll see that at the reproduction there in, in Kentucky. <clears throat> then they have the, uh, you know, it's three levels. So, you know, that is that, and that's why I say. So you have, not, you know, you have basically three ceilings because you have one for each floor, and you know, or you could have them, um, you know, wherever. Like I said, in between each cages. I mean. So, you know, in theory, you could have a bird inside, you know, another animal's cage. So, I mean, you know, the singer is saying well, you, can't, you can't find room or whatever. That, it's just not, it's not the case. And as I already stated, uh, the animals in the water were not on the ark, such as whales, sharks, the plesiosaurs. So, their size does not matter. So, again, you know, you'd be like, well, how are you going to get a blue whale on there? They're, they're over 100 feet. Long, you know, 100, you know, 110, 100, you know, foot away, a blue whale, because they weren't on the ark, you know. And again, there was also a whale, you know, like a you know, certain kind of whale kind. So, you know, again, people are just asking, you know, they're just, like I said, trying to find a way to make God a liar. Well, you know, you just need to learn to believe Scripture and also read what it says. It says, you know, he described what animals had to be on. Did he say anything about marine animals on there? No, he didn't. 
So we don't have to worry about trying to find room for the sharks or the whales and stuff like that. Your plesiosaurs, now the plesiosaurs are your, uh, the dinosaur type reptiles, or, you know, they were like the marine dinosaurs, you would call them, or what the scripture refers to them as dragons, you know, like Leviathan would have been one of them. And, you know, they're the ones that they had different types, but some of them were kind of like the serapods with the long neck, and then they kind of had a long tail, but they were like the marine version of them. And then some of them had a shorter neck, like the mosasaurs and stuff, but, you know, they were basically, that's what, that's what a plesiosaur is. They were, uh, like I said, Leviathan, it gets mentioned in there, I think he was the type of one, and more than likely probably like a mosasaur or something like that. Okay, uh, let's see. And as I said, I already mentioned how dinosaurs were on the ark. Now, dinosaurs had always, as I said, lived with man despite the lives of evolutionists as they and man were both created on day six. Now, there are dinosaur and man footprints together in the Grand Canyon, and I've personally seen them there, through, though the sign tries to say, tries to claim the footprints of man came about millions of years later. You know, there's little trails you can hike down in the Grand Canyon, and I used to run down them. I didn't hike them, I ran them. <laughs> but you can go down them, and, and you know, about halfway down, there's a side, there's a spot where there's a footprint of a dinosaur footprint and a man's footprint. And then, of course, the sign tries to say, well, you know, the dinosaur footprint was made, and millions of years later, then man came along and he put his footprint in the same spot. And then, you know, we're created. I'm like, you guys are just fools. But. <laughs> You know, it, I mean, it just doesn't even make any sense. This is, you know, the dinosaur footprint would have got destroyed in order for the man's footprint to be, you know, created. Because again, you'd have to have been on the same conditions and so forth. I mean, it's just, they were around at the same time. They were created, that was created during the flood. You know, they were both by trying to run away. And, you know, the dinosaur ran through and the man ran through in the same spot right after shortly or whatever. And, you know, and then they both perished. But... You know, like I said, they'll always try to, you know, no matter what, they, any kind of evidence, they always want to try to say, well, that's not true, and they'll have some excuse that, you know, they just can't accept that man and dinosaurs were around together at the same time. And as I said, it's just ridiculous and stupid, the, the, the ideas that they come up with. But now, drawings in caves by people depict accurate drawings of seropods and other dinosaurs, such as stegosaurus. Now, you can go to the... Uh, Creation Museum, it's not called the Creation Museum, but it's, it's from the Institute of Creation Research, their creation type museum they have in Dallas, Texas. I don't remember the exact name of it. But in there, they actually showed some of these pictures, and they actually down at the Creation Museum in Kentucky as well, of these, well, like it looks like a stegosaurus, and there are cave drawings and so forth like that. They, again, how would man know how to draw a stegosaurus when we supposedly didn't even know anything about a stegosaurus until like 1850 or whatever? So, you know, obviously man was with them at the time and they drew them in the caves because they probably hunted them or whatever. You know, they, they had seen them. You know, again, how, like I said, how could they be that accurate if they hadn't seen them? I mean, if, you, if all you, like, we just found bones. I mean, you can't get them that accurate by even just looking at the bones. I couldn't get your details of, like, your... Your facial hair, your features, and all this. I wouldn't know what color your hair was unless I'd seen this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So now, various cultures have drawings that resemble them, again showing they had seen them. Marco Polo said the emperor of China kept dragons, what we call dinosaurs now, as pets, and he had seen them in the early 1290s when he was there. And I mentioned this before, but modern missionaries to Congo and Africa have said the natives speak of an animal they call Makoli Mbembe. I mentioned that, I think it was last week, a little bit about it. And they say it is a seropod dinosaur about the size of an elephant. But it's deep, deep in the jungles and lives in the water, you know, like in caves and so forth. And like I said, it's very hard to ever, and there's probably very, very few of them left. Now, when missionaries showed them pictures of animals such as tigers, which are not found in Africa, they did not know what it was, but when they saw the seropod dinosaur picture, they referred to it by name as it was just as much alive as the elephant. Like, they'd show a picture of an elephant, they'd go, that's an elephant, or whatever. You know, then they'd say, you know, I'm sure it's in their language, but I'm not pointing is they would say, that's an elephant, and then they would say, well, this is Moki Mbombi, or whatever, you know, it's this dinosaur, but you show them a tiger, and they'd be like, I don't know, what's that? Because they don't have it in Africa, so they had never seen one. But now the dragon myths 
But my point is, again, they're, they're calling it as, you know, as a real animal like they had seen the thing. You know, again, like, it wasn't like, well, well, what's that picture? That's a neat it's little a animal. Name. You know. But the dragon myths among most nations, again, are there because they are based off of fact. Remember I said mythology is based off of fact. You know, it's a lot of times distorted some. But whether it's a flood myth, dragon myth, whether it's giant myths, you know, whatever. All that stuff is there because it's all based off of fact. And like I said, they might distort it a little bit, but they, you know, a lot of it's true. You know, but <clears throat> as I said, dragons were real and have always been with man and did not evolve into birds as evolutionists lie. And I already told you, in Scripture, in your King James Bible, it doesn't say dinosaurs, it says dragons. Dragons refers to dinosaurs. You know, the word itself, dinosaur, uh, didn't even come around until 1841. So, again, that was after the King James Bible was created. So, uh, let me quickly get through this a little bit here. Uh, let's see. Yep. That is a miracle itself. If a, you know, they, Remember I said that they say that, you know, evolution say that dinosaurs or dragons evolved into birds. You know, that itself would be a miracle if a giant dinosaur such as Seraphod had become a little little bird and then now fly. I mean, again, that just now it proves that God, it proves that there is a God. That, um, that would prove God, not evolution, as only God could not could do something that great. You know, so again, if that in theory, if that's what happened, that would prove that was God, not evolution, because that's just ridiculous. I mean, like I said, some of the stuff they come up with is just idiotic and stupid. Now, many dragon legends speak of fire coming from their mouths. This is not a myth, again, showing how most myths or legends are based off of true facts. At least some dragons did really have fire come from their mouths. Leviathan, I mentioned the marine dragon, is described in Job. Quickly turn there, I want to look at this real quick. Job chapter 41, verses 19 to 21. Job chapter 41, verses 19 through 21. I apologize for running over here a little bit, but I want to just finish this little section. Job chapter 41, verses 19 through 21. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. You know, this is a description of the Biathon. Again, like I said, he was one of the marine <laughs> dinosaurs, if you would call them, or dragons. Now, the King James Bible, as I said, mentions dragons. Dragons, like owls and serpents, have long been associated with Satan. You know, I mentioned some of that stuff before when we were talking about owls and their things, you know, UFOs. How, you know, always in the desert, the dragons would always a lot of times be connected with the owls. They'd always be in that same verse connected together. Now, Satan himself is called the dragon in Revelation in several verses. Quickly turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. And we'll see the connection of dragons and serpents and Satan and all this together here. But we saw in that verse that I read you earlier about Leviathan, that clearly some dragons, and they found skeletons of some dinosaurs that had evidence of being fire breathing out of them. So again, you know, all your myths are not as false as everybody thinks they are. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, dragons are in the Chinese zodiac along with 11 real animals. I'm not going to sit here and list them all. You can look them up. You've heard about the year of the rat, year of the dog, and so forth, year of the horse. It's also what they have as they call the year of the dragon. Now, they are there because they were real as well. They would not add a mythological animal and have the rest as real animals. You know, I already told you how supposedly their emperor, it all the way up until 1251 or 91 or whatever I said, that Marco Polo had seen dragons and kept them as pets. So, you know, the Chinese, they very much knew what a dragon was. You know, so again, that's why it's on the Zodiac, because it was a real animal. It wasn't some mythological animal. And as I said, today we call them dinosaurs, but as I said, this name only came about in 1841, which is why it was not found in the King James Bible. 
Now, modern Bible translators are too gutless and too many believe in evolution to put the word dinosaur in their Bibles. And in closing, the giant lizard Komodo dragon even still has the name dragon in it. And the word dinosaur means terrible lizard. So, you know, possibly this is still a so-called leftover dinosaur. You know, like I said, we, we always say things or whatever, but... You know, either way, even its own name still has the word dragon in it. But we'll stop there for tonight, and um, we'll pick it up next week. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time you've been us here tonight. We just pray for safety for each and every one as they go home. Just pray that you... Uh, don't have any damage from the upcoming storm or anything. And then, Lord, we just want to pray for those that were affected by the storm Sunday night there in places like uh, St. Mary's and Fredericktown and others that had those tornadoes that came through. And Father, we want to just pray that you protect each and every one that may be here and those around us. Father, we just ask your blessings on the evening. Pray for safety if each and every one travels, and pray we might be able to return safely on Sunday. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.